clinical social worker. I work for the hospital uh, formally. I'm an advanced care planning facilitator and I'm a therapist as well. Um, everybody seeing that okay? Seems like it, yeah, thumbs up, great. So the overview is this. So what I'll do is I'll start with a short video. Um, so the video was put together by Nova Scotia Health. And it's about a four to five minute video and it goes over all the key concepts that you wanna think about when you're thinking about advanced care planning and making personal directives. And then towards the end, about the last half, I'll do a walkthrough of the personal directive template that we use with Nova Scotia Health. Um, to kind of give people a sense of exactly what to write down um, when you're making a personal directive. So yeah, I'll kind of bring up the video now and hopefully the technology will be smooth sailing and you can all hear it. So I have it ready to go and just give me a, give me a message if you don't hear it. Well, I don't hear it now, so we'll see. See here. Here it's only natural to live in the moment and not think too much about tomorrow. Still, we do buy home insurance and car insurance and even life insurance. Yet there's another kind of advanced planning we could be doing that doesn't have to cost anything. When it comes to our personal care, we all want to have our say. But who will speak for you if you're unable to speak for yourself? Well, there's a simple tool you can use to help ensure that your wishes and preferences guide your care in the event that you can't participate in the eventual, inevitable care discussions and decisions. It's called a personal directive. A personal directive is a key component of planning in advance about your future care by thinking and talking about your wishes with your loved ones and those who provide your care. A personal directive is similar to an advanced directive or a living will. However, in addition to providing instructions about your health care and treatment, it allows you to plan for such things as where you live, what you eat and drink, your clothing, hygiene, safety, comfort, recreational and social activities, and services in the community that you wish to support you. A personal directive serves as a guide for your family and your care providers to ensure that your wishes about your future care are understood and respected. It only comes into effect when you are unable to make your own care decisions. There are three kinds of personal directives. A delegate directive identifies another person, someone you choose as your delegate, and assigns that person the responsibility to make care decisions for you when you're unable to. An instructional directive states your wishes and preferences for care, but does not name a delegate. An accommodation delegate instructional directive does both. It names your delegate and describes the type of care you wish to receive. Your personal directive could include general goals and priorities for your care, as well as any personal beliefs and values you wish to be respected by others, including cultural or religious beliefs. You could specify particular treatments you wish to receive or avoid, or describe circumstances or conditions that you wouldn't want to endure permanently. Delegate or combination directives name your delegate and provide their contact information. And directives of all types can identify others you wish to be consulted in making care decisions or notified when your personal directive comes into effect. It doesn't have to be complicated. You can get workbooks and sample forms through your family doctor, your regional health authority, and online. But you don't even need a special form. Any document you create will be respected, as long as it's clear and easy to understand. To make it official, this document has to be signed and dated by you and an adult witness who isn't your delegate. You don't need a lawyer, but it is a good idea to tell your lawyer about it, just as it's strongly encouraged that you tell your family, loved ones, and those who provide your care. And of course, you should discuss it with your assigned delegate to make sure he or she is ready and willing to make care decisions on your behalf. Once you write up your personal directives, put it in a safe place. Give a copy to your regular doctors. It should become a part of your electronic health record. And if you've named a delegate, give a copy to that person too. When you travel, take a copy with you. Same for trips to the emergency room, when you're admitted to the hospital for a procedure, or when you enter a long-term care facility. 
When should you make a personal directive? Now is a good time, because as soon as you're able is best. Although it may seem far from urgent, it's best done with the pressure off, when you can discuss it with your family and take the time to reflect on your own wishes. In the midst of a health emergency, it's not the best time to be thinking about these things when you and your family are likely to be burdened by a variety of stresses. Taking care of it in advance is a gift to yourself and once. Once it's completed, shared, stored, and settled, you can rest easy. But you can cancel or change your personal directive at any time, too. In fact, we re recommend you add your personal directive in the event of any of what we call the five Ds. These milestones are a change in decade of life, divorce, death of a loved one, diagnosis of a medical condition that could affect the length or quality of your life, or a decline in your general health. If you do choose to revise your personal directive, simply write a new one, sign and date it with a witness, destroy previous copies, and redistribute as you did with the original. Like the insurance that we all buy to give us some peace of mind, a personal directive is good for you and good for your loved ones. It ensures that your voice will be heard. Okay, so that's the video. So hopefully people could hear that. Um, took a little couple seconds buffering there. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of information packed in there. Um, so what I'll do now is kind of uh, unpack that information for you, kind of go through it and kind of expand on everything. Um, so why is it a good idea to prepare now making a personal directive um, or thinking about advanced care planning? It, it's because life is unpredictable, right? We don't know what's going to happen to us tomorrow. We could be in a position where something bad happens and our, our health is compromised and we can't speak for ourselves anymore. Um, you know, I could walk outside tomorrow and get hit by a bus and then I'm in the hospital and I need people to know maybe what my wishes are. So what we know from statistics is that about 80% of us die in hospital or in long-term care and half of us aren't able to speak when we're at end of our life. So what that means is that you're going to potentially be in a facility, in a hospital or a system where there might be doctors and nurses and healthcare members that need to know sort of what you would want done if things escalate. Um, and if you can't speak for yourself, it, it'd be a good idea to think about it now when you're not in a crisis, like it said in the video. Um, and the default in our medical system is to treat us and do whatever we can to keep us alive. That is our, our standard of care, unless you tell us otherwise. Um, in the emergency department, you know, some people might have had this experience with themselves or loved ones, but they want to know your code status. So code status is, is a fancy word for what do you want us to do if things escalate, if your heart stops working, or your lungs stop working, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to do everything we can to keep you alive, like the default, or are there treatments that you wouldn't want to have done for various reasons that we'll discuss as we go through? Um, and then there's a policy um, in Nova Scotia. There's a personal directive policy that when you go to the hospital, we're supposed to ask if you have a personal directive. And if you do have one, of course, you're supposed to produce it for us. And we're supposed to follow what the wishes are in your document. Um, and it is a legal document and we're bound to, to follow the wishes that are in it. So if you didn't have a personal directive, here's what sort of happens, right? If something bad happened to you today or tomorrow and you had to go to hospital and you don't have a directive made in advance, a statutory decision maker is what it's called if you haven't picked a delegate yet to make decisions for you and it's chosen for you if you haven't already indicated that you want someone else to do it. And how they pick it is through a hierarchy um, and it's basically a list of your relatives. So it can start from your spouse, uh, your children, a parent, all the way down to a public trustee. So a public trustee is someone that's paid by the government, I believe, to make decisions for people that don't otherwise have somebody else that could do it for them. Um, and the decision maker is limited in their scope of what they're able to say you want or don't want. And, and they might not be aware of your preferences. You can see that you know, if you weren't able to take the time to say now who you want to be your delegate, it could have could be a public trustee, in a sense, which is effectively a stranger who doesn't know you from from Adam and, and doesn't know your wishes. So it, it makes sense to, to think about these things now. And this is the quote that we always use, we're, we're preparing for the worst, and we're hoping for the best. Now, if you make a personal directive, you, you might never need to use it, it, it only comes into effect 
if you're unable to speak for yourself or you're not capable to make decisions anymore, then they look for your document, what your wishes are, or ask your delegate what your wishes are as well. So you might never need it, but it's like an insurance policy like anything else. If, if it cuts to the point that you do require it, it's, it's really good to have it. So what are we talking about? We're talking about advanced care planning. And what it is, is it's a process of reflecting on your values and wishes related to your health care and personal care wishes if you can't speak for yourself. That's essentially what it is. And the process can look like this. So the process is reflection. So you're thinking about yourself and your quality of life and your wishes now, what you would maybe want to have done or not have done if you were near end of your life and having this discussion with your loved ones. So people that you live with or are close to you or who might be there if you ended up in the hospital might come to your bedside. It might be a good idea to talk with them now and try to figure out what you would want done and make sure they know that. Um, consultation with your healthcare providers. So when I do this with people, I always recommend that they speak to a doctor because I'm a social worker, right? So I, I don't have the medical expertise necessarily. So. Um, it's a great idea when you're thinking about medical treatments, of course, to talk to your doctor or a nurse practitioner who knows your specific medical situation well. And then it's making decisions. So be it verbally, you're telling your loved ones, here's what I'd want done or written down. And we prefer that you write it down. And the reason is because if you write it in a personal directive and you sign, date it and witness it, like I said, it becomes a legal document. So we're more likely to ensure that your wishes are known and followed if you've written it out. But if, if you communicate it verbally, that's okay too. Um, and of course, it's best to engage in the process when you're well, you're feeling good and you have time to do it. Not when you're in that medical crisis, you're in the ambulance and someone's running behind the ambulance and you've got to sign something then. That's probably not the best time to do it. But oftentimes we find that's, that's when it happens because we didn't know that we could make a directive or we just weren't able to take the time to, to do it, right? So what is a personal directive? So it is, like I said, it's a legal document which a capable person makes your care preferences known when you're not able to make decisions for yourself. That's, that's what it is, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, it doesn't include your financial or your estate wishes. Financial wishes are a power of attorney. You make a separate document called a power of attorney for your estate and then your estate wishes would be in a will. So power of attorneys and wills are separate documents but they're, they're also very important, but a personal directive doesn't include that. The personal directive includes medical and personal care preferences. So you can write it or type it up, but it, it has to include date. You have to sign it and the, you have to get a witness to sign it. And the witness can't be the delegate that you named in the document or the spouse of that delegate. It can be anybody else. They, they don't have to know what's in the document. They're just attesting that you are who you say you are and, you, and they sign it for you. So through the hospital, we got special permission. When I help people do this, I'm able to witness it for them. Um, but essentially that, that those are the criteria and then it becomes legal and we were supposed to follow the wishes in it. The video talked about three types of directives that you could make. So you can make a delegate directive, which is where you simply identify who's gonna be your substitute decision maker. So a lot of people tell me, you know, well, my wife knows what I want or my son knows what I want, right? And if that's the case, you might just want to pick them and then write down that they're your delegate. So if you lose capacity or unconscious, they ask them what you want. Some people just make an instructional directive where you're writing your wishes down and I'll show you later sort of how, what that looks like. So then the healthcare providers, if you're not conscious, they'll look at your document and see that you've written down what your wishes are, right? And then there's a combination. So the combination obviously is you, have, you name a delegate and you've also written your wishes out. So the delegate's job is to advocate for those wishes that are written out, okay? Um, and we recommend that you do both, right? We do, you do the combination delegate and instructional directive, because again, it, it helps us to ensure that your wishes are known and followed. Moving right along. So this is the template for the personal directive that we have uh, used, that we used through the hospital. Um, it looks like this. So at the top here, um, personal directive of, of course, you put your name in there, right? It's your personal directive. And then there's a little preamble that you're saying, you're stating your wishes and preferences if you can't speak for yourself. Um, that's the first um, little blurb there. Um, and now this first page, I really say that it's about quality of life for you. So for you, what is a good quality of life for you? 
and then thinking about what circumstances you might be in that wouldn't be a good quality of life for you. So it gives you some sample questions to kind of give you an idea of what to write in the different paragraphs there. Um, and some folks, you know, just looking at this without any help, it can be a little tricky to know, you know, what am I supposed to put in there? So they give you these sample questions. So the first paragraph on this page, the first question is what's most important to you in your life right now? So it's a, you know, a very broad question, but they're trying to get at, you know, what, what gives you joy? What gets you up in the morning? What, what do you like to do? Um, and most people say, you know, when you ask them that, most people say my family, right? My family, my friends, my relationships, interacting with loved ones, that's the most important thing for me. So that's what people usually put there. A lot of people really value their independence, right? And making their own decisions. So it, it prompts you on that. I mean, I've only met a couple of people that are not, they don't care as much about that. And I guess if you didn't, you're, you're kind of more comfortable with doctors and other people making medical decisions for you and that's okay. Um, but yeah, you can indicate that there. And then it gives a spot for if you have any religious or personal beliefs about how your life should end, this gives you an opportunity to write those in there. Some people have very specific religious beliefs or personal beliefs about that and you can put it in there. Some people don't put anything in there and that's okay. Um, if you have a relationship with a pastor or someone at a church that you'd want called, if you were in hospital, people tend to put their names there and put their numbers down. Um, the second paragraph is, is still talking about quality of life in a sense. So the prompting questions there are what's most important to you? Is it the length of your life or is it the quality of life that you're living? So nowadays with medical science and everything, we, we, can, we tend to keep people alive for quite a while. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a good quality of life, right? If, if you're alive, but you're unable to interact with who's around you, or you're not alert, is that a good quality of life for you, right? So some people, they say, I, I want to live as long as I can. You know, quality doesn't matter as much. But I would say most people say, you know, understanding we're all going to die one day, that quality of life is most important, right? And I want to live to a decent quality. And then you can flesh out what that means to you, right? Another question there is, is good control of your pain more important to you than being fully alert all the time or vice versa? What that's getting to is if you were near end of your life, say you're in hospital or you're home, but you can't communicate anymore and you're in a lot of pain, would you wanna be given medication that are gonna you know, cause you to not suffer to the point that you might even be sleepy or you might be asleep, right? So some people are, it's important to them. They say, I can take a lot of pain. I wanna be as alert as I can for my loved ones and my family. So this is your opportunity to say, you know, give me the drugs and keep me comfortable and I don't mind if I'm asleep or I can take, you know, let's try to achieve a balance of alertness and pain control. You can put that in there. That's an important one. And then at the bottom, the last paragraph, um, it says, if possible, I wish to avoid the following. So this is pretty important. So this is when you're be in a circumstance that you have not a good quality of life for you, and you'd rather your life end than you stay in those circumstances for a long period of time. So that's a mouthful, but there's a couple tools that are in this that kind of help you think more about that. Um, say you were, like we said, not alert anymore, or you're not able to recognize your family or friends. You know, God forbid you had a stroke or something like that, you couldn't recognize people anymore. Is that a circumstance where you'd want to be kept, you know, alive if something else happened? You know, if you if you had a bad infection or something, you know, you might say, I don't want you to treat that. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that, I think, on the next slide. Yeah. So here you go. We're getting pretty blunt and real, but this is really the things you need to think about. So this says, are some conditions worse than death? So there's about 13 ticks there, and they ask you questions, and you can answer one to five. One would be, I definitely want the treatments to keep me alive if I was these ways. All the way to five is that I definitely don't want the treatments to keep me alive. So I'll just go through a few of them. So one says, if I had to live in a nursing home, some people are very adamant, you know, I, I don't, that wouldn't be a good quality of life for me. I wouldn't want that. Other people are okay with that. Um, if you can't recognize family or friends, like we said, if you're on a breathing machine to keep you alive, if you need someone to take care of you 24 hours a day, if you're in severe comfort most of the time, um, you can't contribute to your family's well-being. Um, if you answer a five on any of these little ticks, that means you definitely don't want treatments that might keep you alive, then I usually recommend you put that in that third paragraph there. And the language you would use would be, I wish to avoid 
living in a nursing home, or I wish to avoid being in severe pain all of the time. So again, it, it, the document is really a guide for your care if you couldn't speak for yourself and you're near end of your life, right? Um, so yeah, it can be kind of heavy, but people find once they go through this and they do it, there's a sense of relief. You know, I wrote it down. I don't have to think about it all the time. But yeah, these, these are the types of things we need to think about. Sometimes we use language like this. So one of the treatments that they might offer someone, especially if you have respiratory issues, is if you stop breathing or your lungs weren't working well anymore and they wanted to intubate you. So that would be, you know, it, you know, some might be familiar. If, if they had to put a tube down your throat to breathe for you because your lungs aren't working properly, the idea would be they attach you to a breathing machine and your lungs have the opportunity to heal while the machine breathes for you. And then you come off the machine. The idea being then you can breathe on your own and you're kind of okay. Now, when this happens, our doctors are trained to kind of know after a little bit of time if they think you're going to be able to recover and come off the machine and have a good quality of life again, essentially, right? So some people say, I don't want that at all. I don't want that treatment offered to me. Um, the risks of me going on it and coming off it are, are too high. I don't want to deal with that. Some people say this, is that I want to try it. Let's try it. Put me on the breathing machine. And if the doctors think after a certain amount of time, it's not going to work and I'm not going to recover, then take me off and, and allow me to die naturally. So this gets back to that code status question that the doctors are going to want to know. That's one of the treatments that they're going to want to know about. Um, and there's a spot here in the document where you can kind of put that you want a time trial of that, that I'll discuss too. Um, this is the second page of our Nova Scotia Health template for the personal directive. So at the top, it is essentially an area where you're able to kind of say what your preferences would be um, when your life's going to end. So what would a good death look like for you? Um, it, it might sound silly, but it isn't, right? We, we take the time now to think about these things and say where you want to be when you die. If you, if you could have your way, would you want to be at home with your loved ones? Would you want to be in hospital where the good care is? Um, that is an important preference for people, right? Um, and, you know, who do you want around you if you're going to die soon? Do you want certain music playing or what are things that would give you comfort? Um, we also talk here about palliative care. So palliative care is a service to the hospital. Um, if you're near end of life and you have maybe a lot of symptoms that need help being managed, um, it's a specialized team that can come in and their job is to make sure that you're comfortable basically, um, and that you're not suffering and, and they allow people to kind of have a good death, right? So you can say that in there. You say, I, want I would like palliative care offered if I was near end of my life, things like that. Now under that, it says, the second paragraph, I'm certain I don't wish under any circumstances that the following treatments or interventions be used in my care. So this is where we would put, you know, CPR or intubation so CPR, for people that aren't familiar, is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So if your heart stopped working, um, what they want to do, you know, if your heart stopped, do chest compressions, kind of push on your chest down two inches. Um, and the idea is that your, your blood isn't pumping, your heart's not working. So they're pushing down to get that blood going to kind of try to save your life. Now, what we know about that is if they do it right, they push that far down a couple inches, they might break your chest bones, your ribs, your sternum. Um, you could suffer some brain damage for, due to lack of oxygen because your blood wasn't pumping um, if you survive it, right? So the odds of an otherwise healthy person surviving CPR is uh, one in five. So that's 20%. So you have a 20% chance of surviving if they found you down on the floor and your heart had stopped and they're, they're going to do CPR on you. Um, if you have longer heart issues, like if you have heart disease or lung disease, it goes to one in 20. So then it's about a 5% chance that it'll work. And when I say work, meaning you recover and you, you come back to a decent quality of life. Most people, you know, if they get CPR, you could end up in the ICU, right? And you might be on the breathing tube anyway to recover after it's done. And it's quite an assault on your body. So it, it, it's not like we see on television where people get CPR and they're hopping up and everything's fine the next day, right? It's, a, it's quite an assault to your body. Um, and people need to know 
the reality of that so you can make an informed decision. Knowing that people still choose, no, that's what I want. I wanna try that. Let's do that and do everything we can. So if you did still want that offered, then you don't put anything in this paragraph. You don't put anything, right? Intubation we talked about, that's if your lungs aren't working properly. Do you want them to put the tube down your throat and put you to a breathing machine and try that? If you don't want that treatment, you'd put it in there. So again, what you don't want, then you put it in there. So you say you don't want CPR, you'd write CPR in that paragraph. If you don't want intubation, you put intubation in there. Um, there's a couple other things that you might want to think about putting in there. We'll talk about later. Um, under that, there's another section. So it's just other specific instructions that you haven't already covered um, that you just want people to know about you. So this is where you kind of can put the personal and a personal directive. You know, you just say, um, I like this kind of music. You know, don't, don't play country music for me if I'm laying in a bed and I can't change the channel or play it for me. Or if I like a certain program on TV or if I like certain types of food, um, anything that's gonna make you feel good or give you some kind of comfort that you'd want someone to know about you if you couldn't say for yourself, right? Um, I had a lady one time tell me that, you know, I, I just wanna be alive long enough to see this Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. Um, so we put that in there and it was kind of fun. And the joke was that, well, I guess she's gonna live forever because I don't know if they're ever gonna win. Um, and I'm a Leafs fan, so I can say that this year, hopefully fingers crossed. So um, yeah, that's your opportunity to kind of put anything else in there that you'd want people to know about you. Um, under that is where you name a delegate. So you can, you have the opportunity to name your substitute decision maker if you're not able to speak for yourself. So this could be anyone you want, right? But they have to be 19 years of age or older and they had to have had contact with you in the last year. Um, so again, taking your time to think about your wishes now and making the directive now gives you more control over things if bad things happen, you couldn't speak. You say, I want this person to speak for me rather than it's chosen for you from a list. Um, let's go back to that one. So the last page of the personal directive looks like this. So at the top, you get the opportunity to name an alternate delegate. So if your substitute decision maker is unable to or unwilling to make decisions for you for whatever reason, you're able to pick an alternate. So if this person can't do it, I want this person to do it, right? You see how you have more control. Um, and these three at the top are optional, but they're important as well. The one in the middle, it says, you know, say again, you know, let's hope it never happens, but you have a stroke or something or you're not able to, you're alert, but you don't have capacity to make decisions anymore. <clears throat> the doctors would want to do a capacity assessment on you at home or in the hospital to just think, you know, determine if you're able to understand the risks involved in treatments or make decisions anymore. So the, there's a lot of ways they can do that, but one is that they have to speak to people who know you, right, collateral. So you can tell them specifically, if you're doing this assessment, speak to this person. And that person is someone that should know you very well, right, can attest to you are thinking clearly or not from how, how they know you, right, because the doctors might not know you in the hospital. So a lot of people use their family doctor or another healthcare professional that knows them really well to speak to the other doctors. Some people say, just talk to my delegate, but you can pick kind of whoever you want there. And then also the last one in those optional categories there says that you're instructing that your delegate has to consult with someone else. So if you wanna include somebody else in decision-making on your behalf, you can tell your delegate to speak to another person. So a lot of people say they have a few children and they wanna make sure other people are included then you can write them in there. Now, at the end of the day, your delegate is the one that has the say. You can only pick one person that has the final say, but you're telling them you have to get this other person's opinion to kind of help out. And then at the bottom, like we said in the video, you date it, you sign it, and you have it witnessed, and then it becomes a legal document. We're supposed to honor the wishes that are in it. Now, I'll go back to those slides I kind of skipped over. So. This one here, it's, it's sort of getting you to think sort of like the, um, the slide about um, conditions that are worse than death, but this is a little different. So this is just showing you the different types of treatments that could be offered to you if you were nearing end of your life or you had a medical emergency. So at the top, um, all, where all the green checks are, there's uh, eight items there. And those are things that you could say you wanna have or you don't wanna have, right? So we talked about chest compressions, intubation, which comprises resuscitation, if you had to go to ICU, all the way down to symptom control or life-sustaining measurements, right? So 
this graph is from Alberta, I believe, so don't get too hung up on these designations. I know there's people at this talk from other provinces, but um, we use a little different one in Nova Scotia, but this gives you an idea of the types of treatments that you could say I want or I don't want, right? So R1 would be you're having, you want everything. You want full resuscitative care, where all the way down to comfort care too, which means you just want symptom control. So you understand that you, your illness or what it is can't be cured and you're, you're gonna die. So you wanna be kept comfortable. So it's all the way down to that. So it's good to stress that there's no right answer for any one person. So you could pick everything, you want everything done or, or you can pick that you want certain treatments, you don't want other treatments, right? It's, it's sort of up to you. Yeah. So after you make your personal directive, what do you do with it, right? So the video described this. So what you wanna do is keep a copy handy. You make the personal directive. We tell you to put it on your fridge. Um, and certain departments in the hospital, we have um, green sleeves. So it's essentially a, a green folder that you put the personal directive in and you put that on your fridge. So what EHS, the ambulance people are trained to do, they come to your house, they're trained to look on your fridge to see if you have a directive before they do anything. So it's a good idea to kind of have it there. Of course, you want your delegate to have a copy of it. The person who's tasked with, you know, advocating for your wishes, if you can't speak for yourself, they should have a copy. Uh, it says anyone who might want to stay in your care, like I said, a lot of people sometimes come out of the woodwork if you have to go to hospital and come to see you and they want to help. So it might be the idea that they, you give them your direct, your personal directive and they know what your wishes are. Um, your family doctor and specialists. Um, family doctors have a little different system than we have in the hospital. So you want to make sure they have a copy so they have it too. Um, we say lawyer, but it isn't essential. And why we say it's not essential because if you go to a lawyer and you say, I want a personal directive, they might charge you something for it. So I want to highlight that you don't have to pay to make a personal directive. Anyone can make it as long as it's signed, dated and witnessed in Nova Scotia, um, then it becomes a legal document. So you don't need a lawyer, but it's good to let them know maybe that you have one. Um, and then to get it uploaded to your electronic medical record, um, if you have a specialist appointment and you have to go to the hospital, you can bring a copy of it with you there and ask the admin person to upload it to your medical record so that it's on the computer system. So if you go to the emergency room, we can kind of look you up and find it. Um, or you go to medical records yourself. You know, if you, you know, you can just take it with you, go there um, and have them upload it to you, for you. Um, yeah. And they'll put it on your record for you there. That's at the fifth floor of the Dixon building at the QE2 in Halifax here. Um, when should you update it? Yeah, so you don't have to keep your personal directive the same forever. If you want to change it, you just make a new one, right? And you, it says destroy the old copies, just know where your old copies are. If you make a new one, the one that's most recently dated, that's the one that takes precedent. So don't think you have to keep it the same. And Things that might trigger you to want to update it are, you know, say you have a death of a loved one in the family, you know, we're, they're called the five Ds. Um, you might see something that they're offered treatment wise or the care they receive might make you think differently about what you'd want or not want. If you get divorced, that kind of makes sense. You might want to reevaluate who your decision maker is or your wishes might change. Um, if you get divorced and you named your spouse as your delegate, when you get divorced, that becomes void. So you have to think about do I still want them to be my delegate? Because some people still would. Or do you want to pick somebody else? It's probably a good idea to think about. If you have a decline in your health, it just kind of makes sense. You might, or if you have a new medical diagnosis, you might think differently about quality of life or treatments that you want or not want. And then a good rule of thumb is just every decade. You know, a lot can happen in 10 years and you might want to reevaluate your wishes at that time. So here's some of the benefits of advanced care planning. Um, so your wishes are more likely to be known and followed, like we said. Um, it's a personal directive or at least communicating your wishes. That's the best tool we have so far um, to try to help ensure your wishes are followed if you couldn't speak for yourself. Um, it says less ethical and emotional distress for your family and for staff members at the hospital. What that means is that, you know, it, it, it obviously would be difficult for your loved one to die, but if you've taking the time to explain to them what you'd want done in certain circumstances or not, then your loved ones would know for sure that you wanted to have CPR done or you didn't want to have it tried or you'd want to be on a breathing machine or you wouldn't, right? So 
oftentimes what happens is we, we haven't made a directive and then we ask your loved ones, you know, what, what would you want us to do? Or do you want us to take them off the machine, right? So if you've already spoken to them about that, hopefully that can help them, you know, have less distress because they know what you would have wanted or not. Um, and staff members, of course, staff members are the ones that oftentimes do the CPR procedure or they're the ones that have to take you off the breathing machine. And if you never made a directive, we might not know exactly if you would want these procedures done or not. So it can be really hard on the staff members too. Um, it says better use of hospital resources. And that doesn't necessarily mean money. What it means is if you know for sure, say you don't wanna to go to the ICU, right? You never wanna go there. Then it frees up those beds for the people that do want the ICU and do need that, that help, right? Um, one of my colleagues that I work with, she's a little bit older, but she's otherwise healthy. She says, if I wake up in the ICU, somebody's getting sued. So she knows for sure that that's really something she doesn't want done. Um, so yeah, we, we, we would love to free those beds up if you know there's certain things you don't wanna have done, right? And then of course, prepare for your own death and to die with dignity. Dying with dignity is really important for folks, right? Is like, here's what I'd wanna have done. Here's what a good death looks like for me. And this gives you the opportunity to think about it now and, and, and we'll try to ensure that your wishes are known and followed and respected. 